Good morning. Happy Easter and welcome to our service at College Hill. Once again, we're not meeting together, but uh, we're glad that we're able to meet as a congregation, whether it's individually or as families, but uh, we are together in that way, and it's a wonderful day, beautiful day. Haven't had very many of these mornings lately where the sun's shining, so God's truly blessed us today. We're looking forward to our worship time together. Have a few announcements before we get started this morning. Uh, first of all, I hope you noticed in the email that was sent out this week that not only is our worship available online, but we have a devotional that's available online this week, which you can access at any time through the website, so hopefully sometime during the week you'll take advantage of that and uh, see what we have available there. A couple of sad notes I need to make you aware of. First of all, Gene Barrow passed away on Tuesday, and uh, hopefully most of you knew Gene. Uh, Gene hasn't been here a lot during the last few years because of health issues, but Gene's one of those guys that was here nearly from the beginning of the start of College Hill. In fact, uh, I can't really remember a time in my life when he wasn't, and so He's been a wonderful part of this congregation for a long time, and he'll be greatly missed. But Gene lived a long life, and he was a Christian, so we rejoice for him that uh, he's enjoying his reward now. But his service will be tomorrow. Obviously, we can't be a part of that, but uh, if you'll be remembering the Barrow family. And then also, uh, Rebecca Keller's uncle passed away uh, on Thursday, and so we're, we're sorry to hear that. But that was... Um, you know, also a happy day for their family as well, as Reagan celebrated first birthday that day, so a little bit of a, a mixed thing for their family, but we want to be remembering Rebecca and their family. You know, this last week, um, I had someone who wasn't a member of the College Hill congregation, but they, they kind of questioned me on the fact that, you know, you guys aren't having service, and doesn't the Bible say we're not supposed to neglect our meeting together? And I had to remind them, well, the, the Bible also tells us we need to respect and obey the governing authorities. And for right now, we've been asked not to do this. This isn't a, a time where the government's trying to stop worship service. It's just a, a short period of time where we're doing this for everyone's safety. And also, a bigger issue even beyond that is the fact that the second greatest command, and Steve and I were talking about this last Sunday, is that we love one another. And, uh, you know, typically... Love is shown in a little different way than we're having to do it right now. We think about the parable of the Good Samaritan and love being rushing to the aid of someone that needs help. And we're really good about that at College Hill. I mean, we, we, we love helping people who are in need. But for right now, we're kind of limited in the way we can do that. And so love looks a little bit differently than it normally does. But we still love one another and we have the opportunity to minister to each other. We just need to be a little more careful about how we do that. But look, look for opportunities during this week to reach out to someone here at College Hill. Phone calls are great. Uh, cards are great. You know, I talked to Cecil Emerson last night, who's recovering from surgery, and he was just so grateful that somebody called and talked to him, even though we can't go to the hospital and visit him. So take advantage of that during the week and try to make a difference in somebody's life. Let's start our morning worship with prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for just a beautiful day, and we thank you for the... The morning when majority of the world is focused on your son and the fact that he did rise from the grave and that we have victory over death through his victory. We also have a hope of eternal salvation with you because of what he did for us. Thank you so much that so many people are thinking about that right now. Be with us during our worship service. Help us to honor you. Help us to realize that although we're not together physically, we are uh, spiritually. And that, uh, as you said, where two or three are gathered in my name, you're there in our midst. And so you're with us this morning. And again, be with us during our worship time. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a little weird this morning to be leading worship on uh, Easter Sunday and to have a church that's empty. But you know what else is empty this morning? The grave. And that's pretty awesome and exciting news, and I think that's really a, a great reason for us to praise our God this morning. Let's start together with this first song. They bound the hands of Jesus in the garden where he prayed. They led him through the streets of shame. They spat upon the Savior. So pure and free from sin, they said, Crucify him, he's to blame. He could have called ten thousand angels to 
the victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, he arose, he arose. hallelujah, Christ arose. Amen. Please pray with me. Our gracious and heavenly Father, thank you for this day that you've given us. Lord, thank you for sending your Son to take on flesh and come to this earth willingly and live the life of a lower classman and dying for us. Uh, and that the story didn't end there, that he arose victorious of death, victorious of the devil, and that he did so on our behalf, that we will have hope for tomorrow and hope to join you someday. Lord, even though we cannot meet in person, Lord, it's such a blessing that uh, the Christian family uh, does not let physical uh, contact be the reason that we can't see each other, be with each other, uh, being with each other spiritually, worshiping together. Lord, thank you for technology and that we're able to do, be together today uh, so far apart. Lord, I ask that uh, in this time, we're encouraging to one another, that we're a light in this world for you, and that we're, even though we're isolated, we're using our abilities, uh, the means that we do have to spread your word. Lord, I ask that you be with all the health care workers, keep them safe, give them the energy that they need and the strength that they need to continue their good work. Lord, I ask that you be with us all, keep us safe. In your son's name I pray, amen. I will be reading Isaiah 52, verses 7 through 10. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. Listen, you watchmen lift up their voices. Together they shout for joy. When the Lord returns to Zion, they will see it with their own eyes. Burst into songs of joy together, you ruins of Jerusalem. For the Lord has com comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord will lay bare his holy arm in the sight of all the nations. And all the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. There is an endless song echoes in my soul. I hear the music ring. And though the storms may come, I am holding on. And to the rock I cling. How can I keep from singing your how can I ever say enough? How amazing is your love? How can I keep from shouting your name? I know I am loved by the King, and it makes my heart want to sing. I will lift my eyes in the darkest night. Savior lives, and I will walk with you, knowing you'll see me through, and sing the songs you give. How can I keep from singing your grace? How can I ever say enough? How amazing Shouting your name, I know I am loved by the King, and it makes my heart. How can I keep from singing your praise? How can I ever say enough? How amazing is your love? How can I keep from shouting your name?
Good morning. It is such a joy to share this moment with you in worship and, and in preparation for the, uh, the hearing of God's Word this morning. I'm so glad uh, that you've joined us from wherever you are today uh, to listen to what God has to say to us. As was mentioned earlier, Happy Easter to all of you uh, and your families. I hope that even given these circumstances that you have a, a wonderful day with, uh, with those that you're able to spend it with and, and a wonderful day uh, as we think about what God has done for us as well. Today we're going to be spending some time not in Hebrews as we have been the past few weeks, but rather uh, going to Acts chapter 1. So if you have a Bible, you can... Uh, Go ahead and be making your way to Acts chapter 1. That's where we're going to be spending most of our time this morning. So it was a Wednesday in March in the spring of 2015. Uh, Wednesday, March 4th to be specific. Wednesday, March 4th around 2 p.m. to be really, really specific. Uh, That was the day and the time when I learned something about the power of good news. Now, I guess you could possibly say that maybe I already knew this, at at least in theory I I knew this, but uh, this was a a different experience because this was one of those times when I knew it because I was living it, because I was feeling it, and that is the power that good news has to change your outlook on a day that's not going very well, Uh, on a season in life, even on life in general, good news, when it's really good, has this power in it to totally reorient your view on life. And Wednesday, March 4th, was one of those days. And it came at a time when we needed one of those days. It was during my last semester at Harding, Alyssa, Smarty Pants had graduated a a semester earlier, but seeing as how we were married by then, she was kind of stuck waiting on me to finish school, and so she got a job in in Searcy, uh, and it was really just a terrible experience. She was working at this mismanaged children's clinic, and it was just a the kind of thing that you dread going to work every day. And and the worst part about it was that, you know, you just really felt bad for all the kids that were going to this clinic that was run so poorly. And and so day after day, uh, throughout that whole spring, uh, it was just kind of getting us down. Then around that same time, uh, Alyssa's dad, Greg, who had worked for the same company for 20 plus years, that company just closed its doors, and and now he was out of a job, and he was looking for a job, and that was just kind of getting us down. Uh, And all the while, Alyssa was uh, applying for grad schools, uh, which is exciting, uh, but it's also kind of nerve-wracking and worrisome, and you spend a lot of time waiting and waiting. Uh, And there weren't that many options for her to go to grad school because we had already committed to come here to College Hill, so there just weren't that many places to even hope to get into. Which leads us to that Wednesday afternoon. I remember both of us were feeling pretty worn down that day. Alyssa had already worked her morning shift at that terrible job that she could barely stand. I was getting ready to go off to class and trudge through the snow because, yes, it it even snowed that day. Uh, And I was kind of grumpy about it. I was kind of in a mood and I was getting ready to trudge to class in the snow when all of a sudden the phone rang and the call came and that good news was on the other line and and Alyssa had gotten into a school. Not only that, she'd gotten into the one that was nearest to College Hill and the best one for us. And it was just this answered prayer Uh, And I remember going to class that day, but I did not trudge through the snow. My feet barely touched the ground. Have you ever had a a day like that where some good news comes and it just totally changes your whole outlook? Uh, It was even better for me, I think, because it wasn't about me. I I was just happy for Alyssa. Uh, And that good news was just such a game changer for us. And even though... The next morning when we woke up, some of those same challenges we were dealing with were still there. Going to that job the next day seemed a little different. 
and thinking about our future and, and the next chapter in our lives, well, it seemed a little bit different too because good news has the power to change our whole outlook. It has the power to reorient the way we see life. And the better the news is, the more powerful it can be. Which is why it is my great joy this morning to share with you the gospel of Jesus Christ, because the gospel of Jesus Christ is the blue ribbon first prize champion of good news. This is good news so unique, so universal, so uh, incomparable, so powerful that if you really receive it, like if you really take hold of it, it has the power to transform your today and change your tomorrow like, like nothing else the world has ever seen. It can take even the most disorienting of days, even the most troubling of seasons, and turn it toward hope. The gospel is this outlook-changing, world-redefining news. And it's all because he lives. So today, I want us to consider the difference it can make for you when you hear this good news. Let's consider how it can change your outlook on life today and tomorrow. Let's consider how this powerful change can be made in your life because he lives. And to me, there is hardly a better place to see this than in the book of Acts chapter 1. Now, to be sure, the uh, power of this particular good news has been on full display before Acts chapter 1. Really, it has been on full display ever since the very first day that the news was spread. Take Matthew's gospel, for example. Uh, on that fateful Sunday morning, the, the first day of the week, when the women came and they found the tomb was empty, it was not only what they beheld that sent surges of wonder and fear down their spines, it was also the news, the news that they received. Because Matthew tells us, verse 2, that an angel had descended from heaven and rolled back the stone, and now the angel set upon it, and it is this angel, which is a, a word that means messenger, news bringer. It's this angel who for the very first time says the words, he is not here, for he has risen, just as he said he would. That's powerful good news. And then that news-bringing angel says, it's time to spread the news. So go, verse 7, quickly, and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he is going before you to Galilee, and there you will see him. And really from that moment forward, the power of this world-changing good news has been felt. Uh, the ability of this particular good news to change our lives has been on display ever since the first moment, ever since day one. But today, for me, the place where I want to see this power, the power of this good news, is just a few days later in Acts chapter 1. Because it's here in Acts chapter 1 that the power of this good news faces its first disorienting test. Here in Acts 1, just a few days after the tomb, the disciples who have heard the news and who have even seen the risen Lord are going to be on the threshold of this new and precarious and uncertain and frankly kind of terrifying new phase in their lives. And we're going to find them literally looking to the sky for answers. But for the first time in their recent lives, Jesus is not by their side with answers. They've heard the news. They've seen the risen Lord. But in Acts chapter 1, the disciples are embarking on this new phase in their lives, this new season, where Jesus is not by their side. And the question is, will the power of this good news, 
Will it change the way that they face this new day? Will it transform the way that they look at this new and scary season of their lives? Will the good news give direction? Will it give hope to a disorienting time in life? To me, those sound like questions I want to know the answer to. Because I want to know if this good news has the power to do that for us too. And so I think that's one of the reasons we have Acts chapter 1. If you haven't gotten your Bibles ready, go ahead and be turning there. Uh, So this chapter begins from the very first verse, kind of like uh, a part two episode of whatever your favorite TV show is, one of those cliffhanger episodes uh, previously on Days of Our Lives or, or whatever you like watching. Uh, this is a, the beginning of Acts chapter 1 is like that in that this is picking up the story where it last left off. So Luke, who writes Acts, also wrote the Gospel of Luke. And here in verse 1, he addresses that and he says, Previously on, uh, in the first book, O Theophilus, the book of Luke, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. He presented himself alive to the apostles, after suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, Jesus ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So here we have the beginning of Acts, and it tells us that Jesus appeared to the apostles, like they really saw him. And when they saw him, Jesus gave them instructions to wait. And where does he tell them to wait? In Jerusalem. He says, Wait, do not depart from Jerusalem. Now hold on to that thought because it's going to be important in just a minute. Verse 6. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of of the earth, just as that passage from Isaiah we read a moment ago has prophesied. And then, verse 9, when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And now, when we get to verse 10, the disciples are just kind of left there, gazing up at heaven looking up at the sky. And this is the situation that I really want us to consider this morning. So here we have the disciples, and Jesus is gone. And they're looking up at the sky above them, and everything in their lives at this moment has changed, and it sure doesn't seem like it's changed for the better. So here they are. They're waiting in Jerusalem. They're waiting in the very city where Jesus has just been arrested and executed. That's where they're told to wait. And not only are they told to wait there, but they are also told that in a few days, you're going to be my witnesses there. Like it's going to be your job, disciples, to convince the very city that just a few days earlier shouted down Pilate, crucify him, crucify him. It's going to be your job to convince those people that the Jesus they hung on the cross like a suspicious criminal was actually the Messiah that they were waiting for. And not just that, but he was the Son of God. And not just that, but he's not dead. But that he's actually alive again. That's a tall order. And they are told that they're going to be doing this in public, in the very same place where those same rulers and leaders who murdered Jesus because they were so threatened by him are still in their seats of power. And did I mention 
Jesus is gone. So here they are. They're looking up at the sky. Could there be a more disorienting, a more daunting, a more terrifying twist in their life stories than this one right here? Like, what is tomorrow going to bring? And when it comes, what are we going to do? How are we going to face these uncertain times? And yet, just when things seem to be their most confusing, their most daunting, their most disorienting, at that moment, the disciples are given this word of reassurance. And what is that word? Verse 10. While they were gazing into heaven, he went, and as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So what is this word of reassurance that they get? The good news is, don't forget, he lives. And not only does he live, but he reigns. And not only does he reign, but he will return just as you saw him go. You see, even these disciples who have heard that message and who have actually laid their eyes on the risen Lord, even they still needed to be reminded of this powerful good news that changes your outlook on life. So here they are, and, and basically they're told, yes, what you're facing is daunting, but why are you looking at the sky? Because he lives, it's a whole different ballgame. You may not have realized that yet, but you will. He lives. He reigns. And he's coming back. See, this is precisely the message that the disciples need to hear as they are on the threshold of this disorienting moment in their lives. And when this word of reassurance comes, when this good news comes to them, suddenly the disciples' fears are reoriented to faith. And suddenly their confusion is refashioned into courage and suddenly their helplessness is transformed into hope. And all of these things are so because he lives. You see, this message that we proclaim, this gospel truly is an outlook-changing, world-redefining news because he lives. And after this moment, after receiving this reassuring news and also after receiving the Spirit, these disciples are never going to be the same. Their outlook on life is never going to be the same. Don't believe me, just read the book of Acts. I'll give you a few examples this morning. Think about when Peter, in chapter 2, who once denied Jesus three times in public just because he, he wasn't ready to claim him as his own. He wasn't ready to take ownership of Jesus in a public way. Now in Acts chapter 2, Peter proclaims him publicly before thousands and, and persuasively. He's showing that his outlook has changed because he lives. Peter, like some of you did this week, is finishing the sentence because he lives, I can own his name. Because he lives, I can claim him as my Lord. Meanwhile, in Acts chapter 4, uh, Peter and John are, are arrested because they've been proclaiming the name of Jesus. They're arrested by the very same leaders who put Jesus on trial and killed him. And a few days ago, this would have sent them running. But now they show just how much this powerful good news changes everything. And they say, look, is it right for us to listen to God or you? We cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. They're saying, because he lives, 
We are not afraid. The next chapter, all of the 12 are arrested by those same leaders. They're locked up for sharing the good news. Where do we find them the very next morning? Uh, the angel has let them out of jail, and they're back in the temple sharing the same good news. And so the, the leaders come, and the high priest questions them. They say, we told you not to talk about this. What do they say? Well, the God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree, as if to say, what are you going to do? The empty tomb has totally reoriented our outlook on life. It's reoriented our outlook on your threats. And you can't make us cower in fear anymore. Because he lives, we know God's power. There is no obstacle that he cannot overcome because he lives. So there's this total transformation that happens among these 12 people who have internalized and now truly believe the good news that changes everything. We can see it in their outlook on life. It's different than it was before. It changes right before our eyes. And when they face uncertainty, and when they face their fears, and when they face today and tomorrow, they're not going to face it the same way. Because they know that he lives. Their lives have been changed by this world-redefining news. And it's all because he lives. And so it brings me great joy to say to you this morning, that can be true of us too. It actually brings me even greater joy to say, that is true of us too. Not just can be, but is true. Your lives, so many of you, have been changed because he lives. Your outlook on the world, your outlook on today and tomorrow is not the same because of this good news. And I wanted this morning to give you a chance to show that. When we began this week, I asked you to answer the question, How has your life been changed because he lives? And I know that every one of you could give an answer to that question. But I was just simply asking for some of you to share one reason, one part of your life, one part of your outlook that's different because he lives. And I ask you that question because I wanted us to show one another the difference it makes when we hear good news like this good news. The difference it makes because he lives. So I put your responses into this video here. And let's take a look and let's see how Christ has been a game changer in all of our lives. I believe in the sun. I believe in the risen one. I believe I overcome by the power of His blood. Amen, amen. I'm alive, I'm alive because He lives. Some join the one that never ends because he lives. I was dead in the grave, I was covered in sin and shame. I heard mercy call my name. He rolled. The stone away. Amen. Amen. I'm alive, I'm alive because he lives. Amen. Amen. Let my song join the one that never ends because he lives. I can face tomorrow because he lives, every fear is 
son. I know he holds my life, my future in his hands. He lives. Amen. 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 Let my song join the one that never ends, because He lives. Because He lives. My Savior lives. wanted us to, what I wanted us to come away with is what you shared. And that is that if Christ really is risen and and we believe that he is, that is the kind of good news that changes your life. And maybe today you need that news to change your life for the better. What the gospel invites us to do is to repent of our sins, be baptized in the name of Jesus. These are indicators that our outlook on life is not the same. And not just our outlook, but our lives are not the same. We are not people in sin anymore. We're people in Christ. And because he lives, our lives are going in a new direction, a better one. Maybe you need that today. Because this is the kind of message that really does change everything. And along with that, I would also say, if we believe that Jesus lives, we have an obligation to our world to show that change that it makes in our lives. We ought to be walking, breathing examples of the things you wrote on those pages. That We ought to be walking billboards of the messages you shared today. To show a life that is better because he lives. So I want to challenge us today. Let's resolve to do that. Let's consider how we can show the change that it has made in our lives because he lives. And let's do so now while we sing this song of encouragement. God sent His Son, they called Him Jesus, He came to love, heal and forgive, He lived and died to buy my pardon, an empty grave to stand to prove my Savior. Oh, uh-huh.
chapter 26. If you have a Bible, if you'd like to be turning there. Beginning in verse 36, it says, Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Could you men not keep watch with me for one hour, he asked Peter? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My Father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. 
When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. You know, right now, we're struggling a little bit with our own will. Not that we don't all the time, but it's a little bit difficult right now when somebody's telling you that you can't leave your house and go get something at a restaurant or go to a movie or go to a ball game or go to work because we're pretty much used to, especially in America, doing things our way. And giving up our will is something that we struggle with, even during regular times. But just think about Jesus. Jesus has been in a situation forever where his will was all that mattered. Whatever he wanted, that's exactly what happened. Then he comes to earth and he gives up all of that, all of his splendor and glory in heaven, the life that he had always known to live as a human being and then be tortured and killed. And he didn't want any of that. As he's praying to God, he's he's making it quite clear, this is not what I want. This is not my will But for the benefit of others, for the benefit of what you need me to do, I'm willing to give that up for everybody else. You know, right now we're being asked to give up our will for the benefit of others. And really, if you think about it, as Christians, that's what our life is really supposed to be about all the time. Giving up ourselves, giving up what we want for the benefit of everybody else and doing what we can to make their life better. And Jesus gave us the ultimate example of that. So as we go through the month of April and we talk about different things that Jesus gave up, in addition to giving up his life, this week we want to remember that he gave up his will, what he wanted, the will that had ruled throughout all eternity. But he did that for our benefit. And what an incredible lesson that is. So let's prepare to take the the bread as remembrance of Jesus' body that was sacrificed on the cross. And we'll pray about that, but let's remember again also that the incredible amount of will that he gave up in order to do what he did. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for today. It's truly a blessing to gather every Lord's Day and worship you and remember your sacrifice on the cross. Uh, Help us to remember your body, which was broken, and your will, which was given up for our benefit. And as we eat this bread, help us to remember that. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's pray again. Lord, we recognize that uh, your sacrifice was really beyond our comprehension to, to give up so much, to, to have your body sacrificed for us, your blood spilled to cleanse us from our sins. is just an act of love that we probably fully can't understand. But we just, again, praise and thank you for that. And as we drink the fruit of the vine, help us to be remembering what you did for us and uh, your blood that does cleanse us from our sins and gives us hope. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Sing hallelujah to the Lord. Sing hallelujah to the Lord, sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah to the Lord. Jesus is risen from the dead, Jesus is risen from the dead. Jesus is living in his church. Jesus is living. Jesus is living. Jesus is living in his church. So sing hallelujah to the Lord. Sing hallelujah to the Lord. Sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah. 
sing hallelujah to the Lord. I hope we're finding ways during this time to remember just how blessed we truly are. And you see things on the news like they had last night of just miles of cars of people waiting for food. Um, I read this morning that a third of Americans were not able to make their rent payment in April this year. And when you think about uh, how, how few of us at College Hill are struggling with those kind of issues, then uh, that's just truly a blessing. And Thank you again for what you're doing with your contributions to keep our work going here. As I mentioned last week, uh, the work continues. We are open for business, although we may not all be here together. Things are still going on, so thank you for what you're doing to keep that going. And uh, let's just remember again this week how truly blessed we are. So let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for all you give to us. Uh, you are so wonderful to provide for our necessities and so much more than that. We pray for those that are struggling right now with having those things. Uh, please help their situations improve as quickly as possible. Thank you for allowing us to continue to be a part of your work here at College Hill through our contributions, help the things that we give to be able to be used to further your work, to make a difference here in this community and throughout the world. But again, thank you for just how blessed we truly are. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen. He took my burdens all away up to a brighter day. He gave me a song, a wonderful song, a wonderful song I now can see. In my heart, joy bells ring. He gave me a song, a wonderful song, a wonderful song. He gave me a song to sing about. seems to be those moments where you're in um, rough times and you have that, that scripture that's just always written on your heart um, that reorients your view. Like Stephen said, that scripture takes that bad situation and helps you turn that around. For me, that's um, Psalms 27.1. Uh, the Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is my shelter and my stronghold, of whom shall I be afraid? Any moment in life whenever I'm having a rough time, that scripture pops in my mind and it just reminds me that I've got God on my side and whatever situation I'm dealing with at that moment, doesn't mean anything because God, God's got my back. Um, so my challenge for you this week is to um, 
find a way to share your scripture that's on your heart, the one that always pops into your mind in those tough situations that helps you reorient the way you're thinking um, with those around you, be that through social media, uh, writing someone a letter, putting it on a tag, on a baked good that you sit on someone's porch, share that scripture uh, that reorients your views with someone else, post it on social media or pictures of it on social media, and use hashtag CHReorient as our hashtag for this week. Let's pray together. God, we thank you so much for so many things. And today, the whole world is stopping to thank you for the fact that our, our Savior, Jesus, he rose from the dead and that he's no longer there. And because of that, we know that we have a home with you in glory, that we are going to get to see you um, and be with you for all of eternity. And God, we thank you for giving us a love and a, a life and a, a faith that lets us reorient anything that could come our way so that we are always looking to you and finding the joy in each and every moment um, because your son lives.